started. Um, so welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Hurry. Um, I've met many of you. I recognise quite a few names uh, in the audience. So delighted to see many of you coming back. But I'm sure we've got some people who are perhaps joining us for the first ever time. Um, so welcome. My name is Oliver Hurry. Um, I've been part of the steering team of the Sustainable Procurement Pledge uh, for over three years now, uh, since it was originated uh, by Thomas Uderson, the CPO of Bayer, and Bertrand, the CPO of Henkel, um, over three years ago uh, as a way to help procurement really just make it easier for you guys to get on and do sustainability, uh, both for the, uh, the profession itself, but also for people and planet. Um, so delighted to have you here today. Um, we've got a really, really exciting session. Scope three and emissions in general understandably dominates uh, sustainability, but also sustainable procurement at the moment. It isn't the be all and end all, but it is a very important topic. So delighted to be joined by some speakers today um, who are gonna be sharing that with us. And they are uh, special speakers indeed. So just to clarify, the SVP um, really is about trying to make it easier for sustainability to be embedded in all procurement practices by 2030, so as it says on the screen. And we have a vision to get a million procurement professionals by 2030 to be really evidencing that they're doing that uh, and saying that we have supported and helped them understand what to do, how to do it, and who to do it with. Uh, we're a non-profit initiative, we're aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and of course aligned to where possible science-based targets as well. We're a global non-profit community. We are really trying to empower and equip and inspire any procurement professional anywhere, absolutely anywhere in the globe, um, we have over 10,000 procurement professionals that have signed up to the pledge uh, and a number of leading CPOs have signed their organization up to the pledge uh, as well, uh, representing 142 countries, every industry you can imagine uh, as well. So fantastic diversity, uh, which is great to see. So the way that we think we can help you uh, and we are helping you is by making it easier to access what to do, the content, how to do it, the tools, who to do it with, the networking, which you'll experience today, and most importantly, often how to encourage your business or your leadership to let you do it, because uh, we've all been there, uh, that when the rubber hits the road, sometimes uh, sustainability historically can get put on the back burner, which uh, we need to try and avoid where possible. And finally, most importantly for the SPP, this is for procurement professionals by procurement professionals. This isn't a uh, invented by some consultancy or someone trying to sell you software or anything. This is for procurement professionals by procurement professionals, and we're going to try and do everything in procurement language uh, to make it easier for you um, to understand. I think that's enough for me. If anyone's got any questions about the SPP, um, you can get in touch with us. If you go to spp.earth, I'll put that in a chat when the session starts. You can go to explore more. You can obviously contact us as well. Um, but without further ado, I will introduce our new and our very, in fact, very first employee, which is uh, Melissa. Uh, over to you, Melissa, to say hello. Can't hear you that well, Melissa, unfortunately. Let me try to fix that. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Great. Technology gets to us. Um, so I know that we have a really full of Agenda, so I won't take too much time, but I did want to say hi to everybody today and just um, introduce myself, as uh, Oliver said, employee number one. And that's really exciting because it's representing some of the, the progress that this organization has made. Um, we are building a little bit more of a team and we'll be a little bit more present and able to, um, to hopefully continue to support this community as it grows. So really happy to be here um, and welcome to everybody for this session, whether you're new or uh, you're already involved with us. Nice to meet everybody. Excellent, excellent. So um, just to explain this session, um, the SPP to cope with the thousands of people that we have in every industry worried about every topic that's imaginable, the SPP is organized into chapters. So it means as a procurement professional, you can almost choose your own adventure depending on where you're based, region, what industry you're in, industry, uh, and what topic you're concerned about, scope three. And so this is a session of the scope three chapter of the Sustainable Procurement Pledge, co-chaired by the wonderful Claudia and Eric, um, who've been working on this chapter from the very beginning. And it is one of the most popular and important chapters that exists. And um, we're joined today by the wonderful team at CBRE, Robin Burton uh, and Matt Langley. Um, they are going to be sharing their insights on what they've been doing on scope three, and particularly looking at emissions factors. Uh, and a special thanks to CBRE, Robin and Matt, because they are also one of our champions. An SPP champion is an organization that doesn't want to just help its uh, professionals individually, but is actually committing and championing sustainable procurement as an entire organization and onboarding all of their teams slowly 
into the pledge so that they can get capability built as an organization. So absolutely delighted to have Robin and Matt. Robin, I'm just going to spotlight you guys uh, so that we can uh, uh, make sure that uh, we can all see you. Um, and otherwise, uh, you should be able to share your screen. Have you got any issues with that? You can do that. Lovely. Well, without further ado, over to you, chaps. And the only last thing I'd say to the audience and those listening in, and we have hit 70, so pretty much bang on with my, with my guest. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, please do put them into the chat. Uh, we will come to you. Um, we do like people to actually chime in and, and, and say a few things towards the second half of the session as well. So don't be shy. Uh, and finally, obviously, do be aware of what you're posting into the chat and what you're saying. Uh, we want to be professional, but also conscious of competition law where possible. Uh, and finally, if you've got anything you want to ask me to ask on your behalf, uh, anonymously, you can also message me. Enough for me. Robin, Matt, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, Matt, did you want to kick off a little introduction from yourself? Yeah, great. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everyone. I'm the uh, Global Procurement Head for ESG at CBRE. And what we're going to take you through today is really um, two or three years of, of tinkering with the mission factors, trying to understand them a bit more to really help us with our baseline understanding of our missions and our supply chain and um, what we can start doing with the next stage. So we were keen to share this because this is where we started. And uh, we've learned a huge amount over the last um, uh, two or three years and, and are keen to really um, highlight what, what the learnings are, hopefully fast track your journey a little bit more and um, for you to understand some of the trade-offs we've needed to do some of the nuances we've come across and uh, and some of the differences that all this has driven for us to really start the decarburizing the supply chain. Awesome. You, Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, um, just further to what Matt said, I'm uh, working Matt's team. Uh, I'm director of the Global ESG Procurement Program. So I've been deep in the uh, in the weeds amongst the emissions factors. And it's really awesome to be able to sort of poke my head up today and, and share some of that with you all. Um, I'm trying to pitch it all to, to all different levels of experience and, and knowledge of this topic. So um, I hope it I hope it's interesting to everyone. Um, I've been working in this space for about 10 years now. Um, so purely in the ESG procurement space, I'm based in Australia, for those of you who couldn't guess from my accent so it's 11 p.m for me for me now so we will be off to bed after this um i joined cbre about a year ago and have been yeah as i said so sort of deeply working on the on our initiatives around decarbonization in the supply chain for both cbre but also for our clients that we do procurement on behalf of as well um i'm super excited that cbre has actually joined uh the spp as a champion member um and yeah i'm excited to be here today it's my first my first meeting and uh yeah i'll wear my scope three chapter badge with with pride so um getting into it uh today essentially wanting to talk about emissions factors in the services industry which is particular to us but i think some of the le learnings we've got from this space apply to all businesses in all walks of life um, we've had a lot of challenges and, and opportunities that we've discovered along the way when we've been assessing the different approaches to methodology and in carbon accounting and have come to a really a strong conclusion off, off the back of that work. So that's what I'm going to be taking you through today, a bit of an overview of the, the challenges in the space, uh, a bit of a sense of um, what the emissions factors are that are out there that you can use uh, and what the different pros and cons might be some of the experimentation that we did off the back of that, um, and then how we built our strategy uh, to, to mitigate some of the limitations that, that exist with emissions factors um, off the back of that as well. So um, essentially, you know, we when we started our deeper research on emissions factors and trying to understand which data set to use, which method methodology to use, how to set our own boundaries, um, we sort of realized that emissions factors will always have to play a role in helping us to baseline our emissions. Um, they are a sort of integral part of the of the space, even though sometimes they come up with a bad a bad reputation. Um, 
we recognize that they're an essential ingredient in the mix for us. Um, so it was, it was important that we had a strong theory behind the way we're doing it, the way we have decided to do it. Um, you know, we recognize that supply chains are global complex and, and rely on a mixture of products and services. Um, and that, you know, emissions factors selection can make a really significant difference when accounting for a unique, organ a unique organization's complexity. Um, there's a different databases out there, uh, each that have different approaches, scopes, boundaries, uh, ways of collating their LCAs, and uh, and they you know come in all shapes and sizes. So determining which uh, database suits your organization best uh, means you know really diving deep on what your priorities are, and then around uh, building our baseline using emissions factors uh, essentially helps us to build the heat map of our most material suppliers and categories, um, which is an incredibly important step. Um, and that, you know, the inherent uncertainty that emissions factors have, which we all have to sort of acknowledge, uh, in turn should encourage us towards better and more accurate forms of data collection uh, off the back of that analysis. So, CBRE, for those of you who don't know, just quickly, uh, it's a property services businesses. We operate globally. Uh, we uh, help develop and manage the real estate assets of Fortune 500 companies, all the way down to small and medium businesses. Um, we, we conduct procurement on behalf, uh, we conduct real estate procurement services on behalf of our clients. Um, and so we're acutely exposed, I would say, to, to scope three emissions um, through both our own supply chain, but also through the supply chain of the clients uh, procurement that we manage on their behalf. The built environment as, as well is a massive contributor to carbon emissions, up to 37% of emissions in the built, come from the built environment. We know that supply chains are the biggest source of GHGs, up to 60% of global emissions, and that supply chains are really impactful in this space. So, you know, we, we know that the, the challenge is real and that the, the impact is real um, and that we're getting a lot of our clients and, and stakeholders talking to us about how important this is. Yet, few are actually tracking scope three emissions in a sophisticated way. Um, so that's the sort of landscape that we're working in at the moment. I'm also happy to share any of that data that um, I shared on the previous slide and have a deeper conversation on some of those points if it's of interest as well. Um, we set ourselves a net zero target uh, last uh, 2021 uh, to uh, achieve net zero by 2040 uh, with a number of interim targets as well. Um, you know, this is a main uh, major driver for us. Um, although working as a client-based organization, our clients own net zero targets is also a massive driver for us as well. Uh, I just wanted to briefly touch on some of the broader aspects of ESG procurement. You know, we have been working towards a whole swathe of different programs in ESG procurement, um, whether it's around ESG performances in general, beyond uh, carbon emissions, supply diversity or governance protections. Um, however, adding the net zero supply chain program to uh, this model has enabled us a focus on uh, enabled us to focus on decarbonization in the supply chain um, and dedicating resources to that to that particular program, which has enabled us, I think, to sort of move at a bit more pace um, in recent years. Okay, so to get into, I guess, what we're actually going to be talking about today um, in more detail, um, some of you will be familiar with the greenhouse gas uh, protocol and uh, I guess how it um, prioritizes different uh, data collection methodologies. Um, today I'm focusing on the spend based method um, as a, it's an easy entry point for organizations that are looking to uh, calculate their carbon emissions in scope three. Uh, it's, you know, uh, a, a great place to start, I guess, and that's where we started as well. So it's essentially, you know, you're your spend in a particular category multiplied by an, a relevant emissions factor. However, I guess the theme of this, of this talk is about, you know, the data journey that we're on. Um, that's where we are. 
that's where a lot of organizations are today, but we're moving our way up that, that accuracy um, scale. Uh, we want to get more data, more accurate um, from, from the source, from suppliers, um, and, and stop relying so much on emissions factors so that we can improve our, improve our baseline, improve our ability to actually decarbonize. Once you sort of scratch the surface of emission factors and 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 carbon accounting, um, you can start to sort of, I guess, understand where the um, where the limitations are and 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 what the sort of benefits are for using these different different uh, models. Very quick, high level uh, for those that don't know. Uh, for those that do, uh, you know, you can just listen to my dulcet tones. Uh, but high level, uh, high level uh, emissions factors are, are generally created uh, by integrating several different life cycle, life cycle impact assessments or LCIAs uh, into an in industry-wide average of emissions for a product or service. Um, there's different types out there, um, uh, different, they have different focuses, different um, ways of working. Um, but this is the type I'll be talking about today. So when I'm talking about emissions factors, this is what I this is what I mean uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, LCIAs are created by assessing the different inputs uh, uh, into a product or service through its direct supply chain, uh, through the manufacturing of the product itself, or the delivery of the service itself, and any sort of uh, disposal uh, downstream that might occur as well. Um, it then measures all the different emissions at all those different stages to combine together to give the LCIA. So all the different LCIAs are then together to give you the emissions factor. All the different emissions factors are all aggregated together to give you the emissions factor database. That's what we're working with. So as we started to peel back the onion on emissions factors, we came across, I guess, six key limitations uh, that um, we try to keep our eye on, our eye on when, when choosing which emissions, emissions factors to work with. Um, not all emissions factors are created e equal. And I'll, I'll get into some of the analysis that we undertook uh, after this. Um, but essentially, you know, not all emissions factors map neatly to all industries. Um, high level emissions factors might um, be skewed and might have a different categorization to the one that you're used to or to the taxonomy that you're used to. They might also have a really incomplete uh, value chain view. So um, it might include the direct supply chain emissions, but not the indirect supply chain emissions. And so it might be undercounting um, they might have incomplete geographical coverage. Often an emissions factor database will be country specific, or it might only include, conclude, uh, include major countries, European countries, or a particular um, sub-region. They're obviously also fixed in time. So only at the point of doing the uh, LCIA is when the data is relevant. And so they won't be taking into account any more recent technological advancements or, or changes in that space. Um, they tend to oversimplify as well. So not capturing nuances and variability of real world, real world situations, um, you know, compared to across the whole industries, which might have different practices and different ways of doing things and, and different environmental uh, changes that might come across throughout the life cycle. All of that comes together essentially to say that they have varying data quality. So different emissions factors will have different, um, it will tell you different things based on the quality of the data that's used to create them. Okay. So what we did initially, our first sort of step was to do a bit of an analysis of which were the emissions factor databases that are out there um, and how can we start assessing them um, we assessed nine different emissions factor databases um, and tested them against criteria that made sense to our business. Um, I'm by no means saying that this is going to apply to everyone. Um, there's, you know, different considerations which will be important for your business when you're when you're doing this work. So for us, it was around making sure that there was really strong geographic reach. You know, we operate globally. 
Um, we need to be making sure that we have emissions factors that are relevant here in Australia and over in the UK, China, US, wherever. Um, we also need granularity of coverage, particularly in service sectors and particularly in service sectors related to real estate. And I'll break down some of the analysis we did in that space as well in a later slide. We want to understand the contemporaneous of the research, how usable the actual emissions factors were, and, and the, the, the cost. Um, on the usability uh, aspect, just quickly, you know, obviously, when we were just getting started, we were hoping to use ones that we could just download simply off the website, you know, and have no, no barriers to entry to, to being to assessing them. And as we sort of um, dived deeper and deeper, we realized that there were other databases out there that we maybe didn't get access to or didn't weren't aware of because because with the limitations we'd set ourselves on being able to get quick and easy access, I guess. So yeah, observation here, I guess, is is really key around understanding what your your key criteria is and and making that the uh, part of your decision making tree. So we essentially experimented with a few different scenarios, each of which gave us a really different result. Um, uh, we essentially we we. We have three had three high level variables when in our experiment experimentation, which is around what is the emission factor data set that we're using? Um, you know, is it US EIO, WIOD, CEDA, or Axio base in this in this examples, these examples? Uh, what's the scope of analysis? So what boundaries were we setting ourselves? What did we exclude from the analysis? What did we include? Um, and then as well, what internal or external assistance were we leveraging? So were we just doing it ourselves on in an Excel sheet or were we engaging uh, third parties in, in the process as well? So the four scenarios that you can see on the screen, essentially we mapped our approximately $30 billion of annual spend in procurement against the four different databases on the screen. The first scenario that we tried was with the US EIO and this was really valuable exercise because it was the first time we'd actually mapped our spend to emissions factors and and at a more detailed procurement category level rather than at higher higher levels we mapped it to the second tier of our four tier procurement taxonomy um, and that gave us our initial est estimation um, i didn't get clearance to to tell you what each of the estimations were and i think there's actually a bit of a distraction on what the actual if i told you the actual numbers it might actually be a bit of a distraction because it's What's really interesting is the differentials between them, but we're talking in the millions, millions of tons of, of carbon in our supply chain, as we could, would imagine with $30 billion of, of spend. The second time we did it, we refined our approach a bit further. We mapped it to the fourth tier of our procurement taxonomy, and we used a database, WIOD, that has multiple country data sets in it as well. So we were able to get more granular at a country level. And that reduced our overall baseline that we'd previously had with US EIO by 10%. We tried it again with uh, CEDA. Um, and this time we actually had a third party uh, partner help us with this mapping. Uh, so using the technology um, to map the factors against our GL code. So rather than to the procurement taxonomy, we tested it out on the, on the GL code to see if that would give us a different result. And that resulted in a 5% reduction in our initial estimation. And then finally, I guess this is the most, uh, the most refined uh, process that we went, went through. We engaged a third party and we actually went through a process of properly refining which procurement categories would be excluded or included in the analysis based on what is appropriate from a procurement, from a carbon accounting point of view. So we excluded pieces of information like like tax, spend on tax, spend on uh, intercompany spend, which is a massive driver of our baseline uh, and uh, uh, employee benefits, things like that. And that resulted in a massive 50% reduction on our initial estimation. Um, so just those few different variables had an enormous impact on our overall baseline that, was produced when we did the analysis with different 
uh, emissions vector data sets. Probably when you look at this, you're probably wondering why the hell did you do it so many times? What's the what could possibly be gained from doing it like this? Um, look at a high level, you know, our drivers were around making sure that uh, we understood which database of emissions factors synced best with our business. And each time we did it, we felt more and more confident that we were getting the uh, uh, database that worked best for us. Um, we wanted to refine our boundaries and set a methodology that was credible and and would stand up against um, an auditor coming in and 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 trying to pick apart the process that we went through. And then we also, I think this is a really key one. We wanted to overcome manual processes uh, that make it really difficult to run re rerun analysis. Um, so you know, in thirty billion dollars of spend, there's you know there's over um, you know, the millions of lines of data in our in our um, um, transactions. Um, so, you know, manually mapping this every single time we wanted to recalculate a baseline was just not feasible. Um, so using different tools and third party partners to help us with that, um, that process was really key. And the the thing we really learned through this process, and each time we did this, we were sharing the information internally with our procurement colleagues and um, and procurement leaders and, and other people that would uh, be interested. Um, I guess what we observed is that procurement people want baselines that are really fixed um, and that reduce over time in a really steady manner. And we discovered through this process, obviously, that as you start to refine your process, as you start to really hone in on what is uh, what is important and what is going to get you the best and most accurate result, the baseline is going to change. And as as you recalculate it year on year um, and and refine year on year, you should expect your baseline to change. And so your calculation of the total amount of carbon that you need to um, abate and, and remove uh, in year one is going to be really different to the total amount that you would see if you did that analysis two years or three years later when you've got a more refined process. And so there's a communication challenge there, I think, for procurement people, because it doesn't doesn't fit our way of thinking, it doesn't fit our worldview. Um, so I think that's sort of a really key thing to try and unpack and, and unpick when you're, when you're doing these exercises um, and to not set yourself up and on a particular number and hang your hat on that as the only number that's relevant. So um, I wanted to hone in a little bit on WIOD. This is a particular example. Um, the same kind of analysis can be done on all the different emissions factor databases that are out there. Um, but just for, to give you a bit of a spotlight, um, there are 46, I think it was, uh, WIOD categories, um, 22 of them are products, uh, 25 of them are services, and the rest uh, utilities are uncategorized. You'd think that sort of gives you a, that gives you some, something to work with. You know, for CBRE, we're a heavily service-based industry, um, and it's a heavily services-based industry. Um, once we unpacked those service categories, we found that actually only 15 of those are actually relevant um, or related to CBRE procurement. So we have literally hundreds of procurement categories that are being tried to map, that we're trying to map to only 15 WIOD industries. So there's a real mismatch there. So we're going to have emissions factors that are going way, way across multiple categories and, you know, Dr drastically oversimplifying uh, the data that we're getting back by saying that, you know, uh, general contracting might be considered the same as a, as a basic repair and maintenance job, for example. You know, construction might be lumped in with something far less emitting or something even more emitting. This is an industry-wide problem for organizations like us, um, but there are other, other industries out there um, that will find the same thing where you, you're searching for more and more granularity that just isn't there. That said, it's still better than nothing. It's a great place to start and it's sort of a, an important first step. 
to zoom in just a little bit further again, um, to compare two of those analysis that we did, you know, you, you remember the WIAD one was a 90% reduction, or sorry, a 10% reduction on our, on our uh, initial baseline, whereas XEO base gave us a 50% uh, reduction on our baseline. This slide just sort of breaks down against our criteria, what were the different drivers for using those different databases? What are the different benefits? And what are the, um, I guess, uh, what's causing that mismatch uh, between those two databases? The most significant aspects um, are around uh, the ge geographic reach. Um, the geographic reach there appears to be the same. They both have 43 countries. However, um, Axio Base has five regions, sub like meta regions, uh, based around particular uh, continents. So it means that a country in the Pacific, uh, like Australia, is not lumped in together with Europe or the United States. So they have this subcategorization, which can make a big difference when you're dealing with a globalized spend, um, globalized spend across um, your, across your business. The second uh, most important one is around classifications. Um, so when we manually implemented WID, uh, we categorized our general contractors, uh, which is a super um, significant category for us because we manage contractors on behalf of our clients. Um, we, con we categorized it as repair and installation of machinery and, machinery and equipment, which does describe a really significant portion of what general con contractors do. But as you sort of guess, once you sort of start thinking about it a bit deeper, it probably doesn't capture the construction aspect of general contractors, which is a really big and significant uh, contributor. Um, then as well, uh, when we uh, engaged a third party to help us in the mapping of Exio Base, uh, we mapped contractors to, um, to construction. Um, so this human decision between whether it's repair and installation of machinery or whether it's um, construction as a category, that's a, is that human decision accounted for about 60% of that difference between XEO base and WIOD once we analyzed it. So the differential between the baseline of XEO and WIOD um, was significantly impacted by that simple, quite quickly made decision. Um, so it's important to take uh, take care and time, I guess, when you're doing these these mappings. Um, another factor uh, was around the um, the data and how regularly it's updated. You know, WID has has not been updated significantly since 2016, uh, whereas our Exo base is updated man annually. So it gives us confidence that the changes uh, and the updates um, are accounting for changes in practices, energy sources and innovations um, uh, are being accounted for. Um, really key for us in this process, once we started to use a third party to help us, was that automation would make this process so much quicker. Machine learning is really um, beneficial in this space as well, because it can start to learn those mistakes and, and improve over time. Um, so that was really a uh, critical part of what we we're trying to assess with, with, the, with our partners as well. Um, and the, you know, the more granular the data is, the better. Okay. So essentially we landed on our, on our emissions factors uh, numbers. Um, and that was sort of step one. Uh, step two was actually making that data usable for our business and for procurement and for our clients. Um, we visualize the data, so we've created a dashboard um, that's available internally to all to all of everyone in CPRE uh, that shows and breaks down uh, our heat map by category, supplier, by client, by business unit, by geography, to give us a sense of, of where our sort of uh, most material suppliers might be. Um, we want to drive a more consistent approach, so the research that we gathered in this process meant that we were able to improve systems for calculating scope-free emissions outside of procurement 
So our corporate sustainability team, which is doing a lot of scope three emissions calculations, we're able to leverage the research we've done and align to the research that we've done. And same with our energy and sustainability teams that are doing a lot of scope three assessments for clients directly on, on smaller uh, pieces of work. Um, it means that CPRE can then adopt a, a unified approach to emissions factors where we're all using the same emissions factors, we're all got the um, same theory and methodology. And so therefore our, our numbers are comparable uh, and, and like for like across the business. And then the next step for us, which I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail in uh, over the next couple of slides is around how we're engaging with suppliers off the back of this. So we understood from CDP data and EcoVetus data that up to 88% of our suppliers have not started or are just beginners on the decarbonization journey. This data from emissions factors helps us to prioritize, you know, which, how we're going to do our engagement. You know, we all understand um, which suppliers have uh, material from an emissions perspective, what geographies they're in, the categories, the line of business um, from, you know, the most uh, emitting uh, suppliers in those sectors. Once, we, once we've identified them using this data, we can then work with them to uh, refine uh, their process, build their capability uh, to report emissions, and uh, then embark on carbon reduction initiatives. Um, this is that using emissions factors essentially gives us the guide of where to focus our efforts to get more, better, more clear data. So what we did with that uh, was de design a proof of concept where we essentially reached out to 188 different suppliers. Um, and this is in the second half of last year um, and asked them uh, as a test to give us carbon uh, data if they had it. Uh, so 32 of them did have it and they provided it to us directly. And then we assisted a further 19 uh, over a four week period to calculate their carbon emissions for the for the first time using uh, carbon emissions uh, technology, accounting technology uh, that we that we uh, sourced and developed a business model that would uh, enable them freemium access to that that service and get a uh, an initial uh, scope three uh, and scope one two and three uh, carbon analysis. We gathered that supplier specific data um, and essentially what it told us was that on average suppliers were emitting 25% less than what we had previously estimated using emissions factors. You know, that's a huge learning for us. You know, once we get that better, more accurate data, we get this 25% reduction in the baseline. And again, it goes back to that conversation around how we communicate this internally um, because all of a sudden our baseline is is dropping each time we get um, more accurate data from a um, from a supplier. We also got really positive feedback that suppliers wanted to do it, they were willing to do it um, and, and really engaged in that process. Um, it proved that gathering primary emissions data directly from suppliers, by either getting their pre-calculated or helping them to calculate for the first time uh, is possible. And uh, it gives us a really you know, strong understanding of where the emissions are in the supply chain. So to that point, this is a visualization of something, some of the stuff we learned in that process. Through the process of concept, we, we proved that you know, we could get that data. Um, in scenario one at the top, this is what your traditional view is when you're using emissions factors. That green bar is all of CBRE's emissions in scope three supply chain. And then it's broken down by individual suppliers in orange there. So each supplier in orange is what we estimated the, the carbon emissions were per supplier. The second scenario, uh, using some, some of that data from our proof of concept that I just talked through, um, we got the supplier specific data, which enabled us to see down into the supply chain. So at that third level down, we could see their supplier emissions by scope. So you can see the, the per supplier, the lines above, oh, this is my little pointer so you can um, see what I'm talking about. The two lines above are scopes one and two, 
and the line below is scope three. So for each of these, these major suppliers along here, we could see scope one and two and three. You can see pretty quickly that it um, uh, breaks down that there is a lot of scope three out there, even in our supply, even in our supply base. Um, they're not creating a huge amount of their emissions from scope one and two. So it immediately directs our effort towards, well, what are they spending? What what is what are they spending their money on? And what are they, what, what are their sources of emissions in their own supply chain? Um, it showed us that some suppliers have relatively simple decarbonization journeys. So a maintenance provider um, uh, that was producing above average emissions, for example, um, from its car fleet. It enabled us to have a discussion on joint decarbonization efforts through electrification of their fleet or rationalization of the way they were organizing their trips between sites. Um, others on here had demonstrated that um, they have very complex roads ahead. So the, their emissions were coming from, from industries that have either their emissions are deeper into their supply chain again, or that they're from sectors that are really hard to decarbonize. Uh, in, in purple here, I think it was around um, the purchasing and use of, of concrete um, as well. So, you know, like there are some, uh, once you get this data and once you get this information, you can start to prioritize and, and understand where you can focus your efforts over time. Um, and again, it sort of, I guess, proved our model that, that, that engaging with suppliers directly supporting them onto that carbon decarbonization journey and, and working with them to get real decarbonization initiatives in place is a really tangible thing that we can do as a procurement team. It sits within our procurement wheelhouse um, and it creates a really significant benefit to the overall business's um, baseline on, 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 on scope three. It also sort of prevents you from getting stuck in the green wishing space. So, you know, Green wishing is the concept of setting the target and just wishing it gets um, gets achieved. Um, you know, actually going through the process of supplier engagement, we found it sort of stops any of that that anxiousness that that's the trap we've fallen into. Okay, so final slide before I get into some some questions and yeah, if you've got any questions, more than happy to answer them and. Also happy to connect after the, the chat as well. But just to, to recap, um, we have some residual challenges ahead of us in our data journey. Um, we're still challenged by manual data manipulation. You know, our spend cube is huge. Um, so we're still, uh, you know, we're, we're determining what tools are out there that can help us to automate that process. We need to get better at um, accounting for reductions. Um, so using the spend-based methodologies aren't going to work. So what processes are we going to put in place to collect primary data at scale from our supply, supply chain? And then we want that visibility even further down the supply chain than what we got through our proof of concept. Um, services that we purchase, we find that the, the emissions are coming way down the supply chain. So how are we going to collaborate with our suppliers so that they can collaborate with their suppliers to actually make an impact on that scope free baseline now that we understand where those emissions are coming from. Um, we expect that emissions factors for our highest emitters over the coming years will be replaced by supplier specific um, entity level data um, that we must collaborate more and that we must you know, start to build this into our procurement processes as well, processes as well. Uh, where we had set it as a KPI that performance on on emissions is a is a a must if you're wanting to work with CBRE and our clients. So um, that's it from me. Um, happy to take any questions or um, Matt, if you wanted to cover off anything else before we went to that. Yeah, I've been been able to answer some of the um uh, the questions and Alexandra, thanks for doing some as well. I think. To kind of wrap this up, the, the journey we started with was really looking at how can we spend more um, with sustainable suppliers? And we partnered with Ecovartis and, um, and we've got goals to, to reach five and a half billion um, this year spend. And so um, then we're kind of next stage was okay, that's that helps get suppliers on the sustainability journey. 
but it, it doesn't get us down to decarbonizing. And so that's when we started looking at, um, at the emission factors. Uh, and unlike others that I've talked to who kind of just see emission factors as, well, they're highly inaccurate, you know, sometimes they're 10x out. We see this as a data journey. And you could see what Robin was going through. First, we started, um, you know, getting a decent spin cube, and then we mapped a couple of different emission factors, and that told us some things. Then we actually identified some issues in our spin cube, and we're kind of fixing that as we went through. Um, and then we started saying, okay, um, what's the next level? So the next level for us was, well, we want the actual emissions from our suppliers, and then for them to upload their spin cube, and we run emission factors. And Robin was saying that the 25 to, to um, or so percent that we get from having that more accurate data. Also, I didn't, I don't trust that that many companies can calculate their emissions that well. Uh, and as the emission factors get better, then because we've got the raw spin data, we can improve that as well. So, so all of this kind of seeing as a data journey. The, the next stage we're trying to think through is around the the EPDs and the the product level data. Uh, that we can start bringing in. But that opens a whole bunch of can of worms as well. Um, and, and so, and we've, look, we've been talking with Cooper, our procure to pay platform, saying, what can you do? Can you help us there? And SAP and others. And the, there isn't a silver bullet out there is kind of the, probably the best summary I've got. And every supply chain is different. So we recommend going down this route, experimenting with some of the emission factors, with your spend, it's not perfect. We're not saying it's perfect, uh, but then look at us with our, our next stage of, of getting the actual emissions data with our suppliers. As we engage with them, it's not only wanting them to go and um, decarbonize themselves and their supply chain and their products and services, but we wanna measure it as well and we wanna see it. And we've got a net zero commitment that is 2040, but we were supposed to halve that by 2030 of the emissions which really means that we need to start now to give suppliers a couple of years to get up on the understanding around what we're talking about here, and then maybe five years to decarbonize themselves and their supply chains. Um, so, so we're actually really feel, feeling the pressure that we've got to start now um, and wanted to share with you all that this is how we started and this is a learning we've got and um, we think it's quite valuable and um, would recommend people going through a similar approach. Excellent, excellent. Um, Matt, Robin, fan, absolutely fantastic. Now we've got 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to do is prioritize anyone that feels like they haven't had their questions answered because not only was it a great presentation, but incredibly good and efficient answering of questions in the chat, Matt, uh, and Alexandra as well. That makes people's lives so much better. There are a few questions, obviously, that, that haven't been answered. And um, uh, we've got a number of questions we could ask. Is there anyone who wants to put their hand up and ask them? Um, I'm going to prioritise anyone that's happy to ask their question personally. So if you go to the reactions button at the bottom, you can put your hand up and I'll prioritise uh, whoever wants to do that, whoever feels like they haven't had their question answered. And if not, I'll pick on Natalie. Hi, are you asking me, Natalie? Yeah, I put the yeah why not? Question in. Go on then. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my question was around collaboration. You mentioned CDP and just in terms of how have you engaged with any other peer companies or other client like similar companies that are doing the same thing to engage with suppliers? So, you know, obviously they're getting bombarded with lots of these questions from lots of people. Great question. Yeah, so Natalie, what, what we're finding is we're actually going a bit further than, yes, so we, we talked to Schneider um, and they've reached out to just over a thousand of their suppliers. We know that um, Apple has reached out to 200 and um, Dell is reaching out to suppliers. Uh, and so, so there are a number of companies um, reaching out and trying to work through. What, what we've found uh, with a number of the others is that they reach out to suppliers and say, register with CDP. And there's quite a bit of time and effort and work to go and register with CDP and then get your SBTI and go through that whole process. And so what we actually wanted to do, um, and again, I, I can give you an, um, a, a sad story about CBRE and how we got our total emissions numbers completely wrong, like hundreds of millions out. Um, and all of that was registered with a CDP. And so I don't trust the scope three data that's in CDP. Um, apologies to anyone 
who's at CDP, um, uh, but the, the data there is, is difficult. And they're using different emission factors and different approaches. And so um, what we've tried here is that we will help our suppliers calculate their own emissions. And then, then we can have a specific discussion with them around that. So that's kind of the different approach we've taken. Um, the conversations we've had a number of our suppliers at the moment is that 70% um, of them haven't started on this journey. 20% are looking at scope one and two, and only 10% are looking at scope three. And often when they look at scope three, they're looking in the wrong areas. They're, they're not looking at supply chain, which is driving a, a big amount of it. Um, so yeah, lot, lots of education, lots of engagement mm -hmm. uh, going through this process. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. We, we use CDP, so I understand where you're coming from. We use it very much as a, an engagement platform in terms of have they got the strategy? Are they looking at this? But in terms of the granular data, we're we're sort of looking at that now for some, with something else to understand. Thank you. Next slide. Just to, just to add quickly as well, like there's a mismatch between the number of suppliers available to us. You know, we've got over 100,000 suppliers and they're generally for us, you know, our types of suppliers are, can be really small businesses. And so we need a platform through and a way to engage them that is easy to use, I guess. So it's a key consideration as well. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, would like to bring someone else in and Rachel, maybe if you wouldn't mind asking a question, I think that's a particularly good one. Uh, one quick thing while we're doing that, uh, I'd like to raise um, Anna and Valeria, uh, you asked some very, uh, very important but broader questions earlier on about how to get your business engaged on sustainability and, and how to actually understand how to get uh, more certifications and learning on sustainable procurement. Um, go to SPP.Earth would be a great start on a sort of broader question as you're you're very much in the same boat as others, and uh, I'd encourage you um, on that. Um, Rachel, yeah. would you mind? Oh, just a, sorry, oh. a quick comment on that because we've just gone going through the final pain of asking for a decent amount of investment um, when we're pretty much in a global recession. So, um, so for us, the the investment um, case is a difficult one because it's not like clear, and so we've looked at it from. Um, an internal carbon price. So that's one aspect of our business case and the impact there. We've looked at it from, well, we're a service company to clients. What is the additional revenue we can bring in? And um, how can we um, sort of work with our suppliers and, um, and other different revenue streams? And then we've also looked in, um, well, how do we, um, whatever provider we pick, then we're going to help them grow. And so there's some investment opportunities. So, so we looked at it three different angles um, to build our return on investment and our payback period. Um, and maybe one of those is helpful for you um, to try and pull it all together. Yeah, lovely. Excellent. Um, uh, Rachel, would you like to ask your question? I thought it was a particularly good one. Sure. Um, thanks, guys, for the presentation. That was really interesting. I work in consulting and also do our own footprint, so experience all these issues, both with our clients and our own. So um, very relatable. I guess um, one of the questions I wondered is whether you've thought about the issue of like rebaselining, if you're improving your methodology and it results in such significant reductions to your emissions. I guess that shouldn't really count towards any targets you've set. Um, is that a point at which you should redo your baseline? And how would you I don't know if you've thought about how you would approach that. Yeah, it took me a good week to get my head around <laughs> having to change the baseline. I'm a typical 20 years in procurement and yes, sustainability for a lot of that, but uh, I'm used to having a savings number that's calculated off um, a, a kind of spin and you kind of come through. Rebaselining re isn't something I'm generally used to, but we are internally getting our heads around it. And uh, within procurement, we're getting our heads around it. And within the corporate responsibility team, um, we are as well. Uh, but yeah, we're having to educate people and, and leadership um, internally on that too. It's um, it's a tough one. Excellent. Um, yeah. Go on, Robin. I was just going to say that, um, you know, for a net zero target, obviously it doesn't matter because you're getting to zero. So zero is the final KPI. Um, I guess for, uh, you know, for an interim target where we're saying we're going to get 60% reduction by 2030, how we tackle those is a really thorny topic for us and more so for our, our corporate sustainability team. Yeah. 
exactly. Excellent. Um, so just a quick wrap up for me, but can I just say fantastic, Robin and Matt. Um, uh, we've uh, gained lots of companies over the course of this last year who've become champions and, and offered their support, but um, you guys in particular have been the most proactive by far. Can I just say a huge thanks to you, especially Matt, as you've really taken this on and, uh, and engaged with us. And absolutely brilliant presentation. There's a lot of detail in there for a lot of beginners to get their head around, but for those that have made the journey, um, I think uh, they've got some great stuff as well, but I think everyone realizes how difficult and complex it is, but it's the old cliche, you just gotta get started, haven't you? Uh, so I re really appreciate that. Um, to everyone else, the recording will be recorded, it'll be shared through the SPP, the chats will be digested, um, and I mean, we'll sort of sum it down and make sense of it, well, that will also be shared. Um, so please do engage with us again. The easiest place to do that is through the SPP's LinkedIn page. And there is a scope three chapter special network uh, subgroup of that. So um, if you want to put the link in there, Claudia. Hi, Claudia, do you want to say a quick hello? Yeah, I was just about to, yeah, to copy the link again. And then you said you mentioned the SPP uh, scope three LinkedIn group. So during the call, I saw some people joining. That's really great. Um, it is the place where we want to start to share more information and where we are going to invite people to the to our upcoming events. Um, if there's anyone in here who feels, I guess, super passionate about Scope 3, uh, then please join uh, the team. Uh, Matt, Eric and I are uh, trying to, um, you know, put together an interesting uh, program of sessions for people who want to uh, really um, get on with the, with the scope three topic. So if you are one of those, please reach out to us um, either on the LinkedIn group or um, through the SPP. We are always uh, welcome uh, volunteers. And yeah, there's much more, uh, many more sessions to come um, with very interesting topic. I, th I thought this was like an excellent presentation. I'm like, whoa, you guys did a lot of good, excellent work. Yeah, wow. Well, really <laughs> Thank good. you very much, guys. Yeah, thank well, you. It's a sharing, the sharing, which is one of the reasons why we've joined the SPP as well, right? Is we're happy to share. Yeah. And, and those on the call, if you've got something that you want to share, then then great, reach out to us and let's get this ro rolling. So we're doing it a couple of things a month. Brilliant. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things that is really, uh, I guess, an advantage of joining a group like this is, you know, there's so many webinars out there. There's a ton of webinars out there. But I think what makes this group, SPP Scope 3, really interesting is that it's a very sort of low key, ask any question you have kind of group. So it's not only the webinar where you get information from a consultant company who wants to basically sell the service in the end, but mm -hmm. this is really all people that, you know, are in this themselves and are working it every day and you have questions and, you know, this is the place to ask those questions and we work together, we network, we try to find solutions um, and we help each other. So um, yeah, please join the group. Absolutely nailed it, Claudia. That's exactly why we're here. So, uh, Robin, thanks for putting your email in the chat as well. We will obviously share slides and everything else. One final thing, a few people have mentioned platforms. Uh, I and we have just completed a Scope 3 tools market analysis of about 20 different tools, um, which I've got Gartner and myself uh, able to share for free for all SPP members. So that will be coming out in the coming weeks. You'll get all the slides. It's nice to get a bit of free market analysis, isn't it? That's rare these days. Uh, so, um, yeah, another benefit of uh, the SPP, I guess. So that will be shared. That will be shared in with the SPP Scope 3 chapter and many others. So watch this space and see you all again soon. But thanks, Matt. Thanks, Robin. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Claudia. Bye. Take care. Thank you.